In 2014, mistakes at the helm, negligent modifications to the ship, combined with the overloading and instability of cargo, led to the capsizing of the MVC Wall Ferry off the coast of South Korea. The subsequent cowardice and total absence of leadership in the most critical moments of this crisis led to an abysmal attempt at rescue and the tragic loss of more than 300 innocent lives. It was a foggy April evening in 2014 at the port of Incheon in South Korea. The Incheon passenger terminal saw the Roll-On Roll-Off or Row Row Ferry MVC wall loading cargo and boarding passengers for this route Incheon to Jeju Island and back up to three times weekly since roughly spring of 2013. Jeju Island, home of Halasan National Park, Seongsan Sunrise Peak, the dormant volcano crater, and many other similar attractions, is a popular destination for families, tourists, and especially field trips from South Korean schools. 325 students and roughly a dozen staff from Danwon High School, a public school in the city of Ansan, would board the MV Seawall, bound for a fun school getaway on the island. This particular trip, for high school students of this age, being a major event and somewhat of a rite of passage, as it's multiple days away from home. The ferry, due to depart by 1830, wouldn't get underway until roughly 2100 hours, two and a half hours later than planned, due to a heavy prevailing fog. Even the voyage to the island, though, was typically an event in itself. Being a roughly 13-hour journey meant the evening departure would see passengers spending the night aboard the vessel with a mid-morning arrival. Passengers typically granted sleeping berths for the voyage or simple bedding accommodations with multiple bunks in each cabin. The kids on board spent their evening dining and even enjoying fireworks launched from the ship's decks, many using their smartphones for pictures. It was, after all, 2014, so the large majority of passengers were carrying modern cell phones. And hugging the Korean coast along the way, cell service was known to be available along much of the route. The next morning at around 0800 hours, breakfast was served as the vessel transited the Mangol Channel, while most passengers remained in their cabins. The channel, a shortcut roughly 11 miles to the southwest of Jindo Island, was notorious for its undercurrents requiring much experience to navigate safely. Their destination now only two and a half hours to the south, traveling at their current speed of 18 knots, Jeju Island, was just over 50 miles away. But as the seawall was exiting the channel, the vessel made a series of turns, one turn so abrupt it exceeded the vessel's restoring force. At this speed and at such a degree, the final turn, thought to be at 849, caused a 20 degree list to port. The vessel was listing to this side so severely, cargo containers and vehicles began sliding, falling, and piling up on the port side, exacerbating the already nearly unrecoverable condition. The massive vessel's restoring point was now greatly exceeded, or the point where the center of gravity has been pushed far enough that the ship could no longer ride itself. The ferry began taking on water via bow and stern doors at first and then open doors, hatches, and windows along the C and D decks on the port side. In the meantime though, while extremely sharp turns for a vessel of this size, in some instances, in the beginning stages of a large ship capsizing, it's a relatively slow and not overtly concerning situation, at least from the passenger's perspective, who are, by all accounts, at the mercy of the crew's guidance, especially during such an emergency, and for miners, even more so. Continuing to take on water and its subsequent rollover progressing unabated, the passengers would continue to be told, via PA announcements from crew members, to put on life preservers but, quote, stay put and remain in their cabins. the only communication many would receive from those with authority to guide evacuations. At 8.52, a Danwon school student, Choi Duk Ha, made the first call to Korea's National Emergency Services number, 119. The student reported via their cell phone the seawall was capsizing, and the call was transferred to the Republic of Korea's Coast Guard station at Mokpo. Three minutes later, at 8.55, the first mate placed the vessel's first official distress call from the bridge. This call would be placed at Jeju Island Station, however. 
the first mate had forgotten their two and a half hour delayed departure and reported their position as being near their destination, two and a half hours to the south, rather than the stricken vessel's actual position just southwest of Jindo Island. Between 0900 and 930, patrol vessel 123 and two helicopters dispatched from the Mokpo Coast Guard Station arrived on scene along with one helicopter from Coast Guard Cutter 3009, the Cutter Station 70 miles away. On scene, mass confusion ensued, which we will delve into in detail later in this video. For now though, while the passengers remained in their cabins and the ferry's rollover approached and slowly went beyond 60 degrees, the orders to stay put broadcasting over the PA from the guest services desk repeated on a loop until passenger compartments flooded and the PA system presumably ceased to function around 9.52. The waters in this part of the Yellow Sea, a frigid 54 degrees Fahrenheit or 12 Celsius. From the passenger's perspective, they were given no further instruction, nor did they have any idea what was going on outside or in other parts of the vessel. During this time, amongst the confusion, many civilian ships and fishing boats had arrived quickly as well, ready and willing to do anything they could. Captain Lee Jun Sok and his crew were amongst the first and only groups rescued directly from the vessel. One brave adult passenger did gather what few students he could and rush them up to the exposed decks while a Coast Guard helicopter hovered nearby, ensuring the helicopter crew saw them, they could not be ignored, and the students were rescued. However, there were otherwise very few people to be found aboard the still exposed starboard side awaiting rescue, and no rescue teams would penetrate any further into the vessel to check for more survivors. In the final moments before totally inverted, the chief communications officer, Dae Hong Yang, two guest service crew members, and a handful of high school teachers helped what few students they could escape the now flooded passenger cabins. At roughly 1017, with the vessel beyond 100 degrees of rollover, roughly 150 to 160 passengers jumped from the inverted decks into the freezing water. The vessel would soon be completely inverted, with only a small portion of the bow exposed. And while grim, difficult, and seemingly impossible, these were still critical moments where rescue could be carried out effectively by trained response teams. No such attempts would be made though. In fact, the sickening actions of the Korean government that day, and the weeks, months, even years to follow, were enough to destroy the credibility, the integrity, of an entire nation's leadership, all in the name of classist authoritarianism and aggressive attempts to prevent public defamation of the hegemony. The MV Seawall, a diesel ferry launched in 94 by Hayashikane Shipbuilding of Japan, started its life as the ferry Naminoe under original owner Oshima Unyu out of Naze, Japan, then purchased in 07 by Japanese A-Line Ferry Company out of Kagoshima where it operated until 2012, all without incident and largely unchanged from its original design, when it was purchased by Chonghai Jin Marine, a ferry and shipping company out of Incheon, South Korea. The vessel had offset stern ramps for roll-on, roll-off cargo, such as cars and trucks, along with deck space on the bow for cargo containers. All of these accommodations planned to be utilized frequently, both to and from the island of Jeju. This style of row-row ferry is also quite common in Korea, and especially Japan, where A-Line still operates many to this day, although A-Line operates the much less retrofitted models directly from the shipbuilders, used as built from their shipyard. Chonghai Jin Marine, on the other hand, had a long record of questionable practices prior to the Dominoway's purchase. A reported five crashes between 2003 and 2011 alone, attributed directly to poor helmsmanship and pilotage aboard Chonghai Jin Marine ferries, and an oil tanker also operated by the company crashed in 2003. Non-fatal, these crashes earned a recommendation by regulators to suspend or even revoke the company's license to operate, but this was never enforced. In fact, Chonghai Jin's purchase of the Naminoe took place soon after their 2011 Korean Maritime Safety Tribunal, instead expanding the fleet by adding the vessel the following year. The company even reportedly had another ferry accident near Sionmi Do, an island off the coast of Incheon, just a few weeks prior to the seawall tragedy. Prior to being put into service though, Chonghai Jin would perform some major modifications. The current passenger capacity for the Naminoe was lower than Chonghai Jin required, and thus cabins and decking were added to the third, fourth, and fifth decks toward the stern, giving it an additional capacity of 117 passengers. 
The passenger decks would also alter the center of gravity, raising it up or, to oversimplify, make the ship slightly more top-heavy toward the stern. The newly retrofitted, now MV Seawall, would feature an unchanged length and width of 146 meters and 22 meters respectively. A total ship weight of 6,825 tons increased from 6,586 tons. Total cargo capacity, including vehicle weight, reduced dramatically due to renovations from 2,437 tons to 1,077 tons, which meant a car and truck capacity of roughly 90 vehicles. At this weight, 2,418 tons of ballast water was needed for stability, and passenger capacity increased from 804 to 921. The use of ballast water is common in shipping, where water weight held below decks and tanks lining the hull lowers the center of gravity and creates more restoring force, or the ability to ride itself in the event of rolling from side to side during normal operations. There are ways to calculate how much ballast water is needed to counteract cargo on deck, at least up to a certain point of cargo tonnage. From the start of their ownership though, Chang Hai Jin would handle the seawall's retrofit, safety protocols, cargo handling, and day-to-day -day operations nowhere near above board. Even the simple ballast calculations had never been well understood by the company regardless of the updated tonnage, including the newly added weight of their own rushed, retrofitted passenger decks. In the past, dock workers had complained on multiple occasions that the seawall was so inherently unstable, even when docked and unloaded, it lurched or rolled severely to either side during load and unload operations. The Korean Register of Shipping, or KR, the agency responsible for certifying commercial and passenger vessels to operate in this area would certify the ferry's operational readiness via falsified documents provided by Chong Hai Jin and without any review of schematics for plans to secure cargo aboard the newly renovated vessel. The total spend for safety aboard the vessel was said to have been roughly 2300 won or 2 US dollars for a fake safety certificate. In addition, personnel had flat out received zero training nor were any evac drills ever performed by the crew. Life rafts were not properly certified nor inspected and most likely unfit to be considered operational. PFDs, personal flotation devices, or life jackets, were not stored on upper decks nor near evac points, only in passenger cabins. In addition to this, the Chong Hai Jin oil tanker crash of 2003 took place in the Mangal Channel, at which time the company was asked by the Korean Maritime Safety Tribunal to cease using the channel, as it was unnecessarily dangerous for minimal gain. Chong Hai Jin would insist on using this route though, as it meant a whopping 7.5 miles would be shaved off the near 300 mile Incheon to Jeju voyages. Chong Hai Jin would routinely overload their vessels and provided no training in the securing of cargo to their decks, and the seawall was the epitome of these practices. There are plenty of examples around the world where vehicles on ferries aren't strapped down, of course. However, the conditions of the water where these vessels travel plays a crucial role and the seawall was plying a route well-traveled, well-known to require additional cargo lashings. With a capacity of roughly 90 vehicles, the seawall's load of 124 cars and 56 trucks that day was a major contributing factor. Chong Hai Jin had also loaded 1,157 tons of additional containers and pallets. The vehicles and freight brought the total cargo load to 2,142 tons, and keep in mind, none of which secured to the deck properly, not even the containers. At this amount of load, the vessel would require even more than the 2,400 plus tons of water ballast as mentioned before, but crew members saw fit to only maintain just over 1,000 tons, far short of what was needed. At this current amount of ballast, their cargo capacity maximum would have been roughly 500 tons at most to maintain stability. To oversimplify, the ballast needing to be at least double the cargo tonnage in this vessel. The use of fuel and water by this point in the voyage as well, possibly reducing ballast weights further and thought to have lessened the stability even more than at departure. Just after entering the Mangal Channel, on the morning of April 16, 2014, the captain Lee Jun Sok with 40 years experience and significant time aboard the seawall, left the bridge at 8.41. The ferry would transit the channel while third mate Park and Helmsman Cho had the bridge. Park would instruct Helmsman Cho, the crew member steering the ship, to perform two turns, 
both to starboard the first 5 degrees to achieve a heading of 140, and then once more to 145 degrees to put them on a more southerly course for the port of Jeju after transiting the channel. Third Mate Park had a year and a half experience steering ships with five months of that aboard the seawall, but no experience steering through the Mangol Channel in this direction, and Helmsman Cho had six months experience aboard the seawall. The bridge crew was aware that turns could be no greater than five degrees at a time, as the ship's lack of stability and restoring force was no secret. The channel's dangerous undercurrents exacerbated this even further. However, after making his first turn to 140 degrees, for some reason, an input was made, steering the vessel from 140 all the way to 155 degrees, a 15 degree turn, 10 degrees sharper than what the vessel could maintain, and this sharp turn was made very abruptly. How and why the turn was made remains in dispute by all parties to this day. Many feel it was confusion on the helmsman's behalf, possibly due to conflicting or unclear orders right before the final turn. The damage was done though, in this sharp turning condition, the ferry listed 20 degrees to port, and at 849 the unsecured cargo, the containers, pallets, and vehicles tumbled and slid to the port side. Restoring force was lost and the seawall began taking on water. Chief Engineer Park stopped the engines at this point and Captain Lee ordered second mate Kim to engage the anti-healing pumps, systems that help restore the ship's upright condition by pumping ballast water between tanks to offset the ship's list and help the vessel ride itself. Whether the anti-healing system could have saved the ship at this point will never be known, as the pumps were not operational. At 8.54, all mates and helmsmen had assembled with the captain on the bridge, and one minute later, the distress call was made by First Mate Kang, erroneously reporting the seawall's location as being near Jeju Island. The captain did order Second Mate Kim to make an announcement to passengers to put on more clothing due to the water conditions, but the bridge to shipwide PA system was not cooperating. Rather than trying to figure out how to perform shipwide broadcasts, the captain and his crew just assumed it was broken. There were, however, three methods of making this happen from the bridge to all areas of the ship for redundancy. An alarm button at the crew's desk, a bridge telephone by pressing zero, and an emergency alarm lever just outside the bridge. Yet none of these methods would be employed. At 9.04, the communications officer at guest services one of those crew members directly responsible for passenger safety contacted 122, Korea's National Maritime Distress phone number. This officer had made Mok Po Coast Guard Station aware of his order for passengers to stay put in their cabins, but the Mok Po Coast Guard patrol vessel 123 that received this info did not relay this information to any other Coast Guard units on scene or en route. At 9.07, the first mate contacted Jindo Coast Guard Station and notified them that the ship's broadcasting system was not functional. At 9.14, Helmsman Park contacted Chonghai Jin Company headquarters in Incheon to notify them passengers were unable to move and evacuation was impossible due to the ferry's degree of rollover. For the next 35 minutes, other crew members aboard the bridge would continue to call the Incheon office as well to quote, report on the capsizing over and over. While this was happening, Crew members were also calling Jindo Station over and over. Jindo Station having been informed of the quote, ship broadcasting system being out of order, instructed the second mate currently on the line to go to the passengers personally and ensure they don their life preservers, more clothing, and prep for evacuation. The second mate did not follow this order. At 9.27, the captain instructed the second mate to announce evacuation to passengers. Now using handheld two-way radios though, Convinced the PA system was out of order, the mate attempted to contact the guest services desk, but did not receive any acknowledgement, nor did he leave the bridge to verify any of this in person. He instead called Jindo Station yet again and notified them that the evacuation order had been given. In the meantime, all passengers in the cabin areas heard, throughout all of this, was the continued announcement to stay put in their cabins, being looped over and over again via the guest services passenger compartment PA. This order given on the judgment of the guest services communications officer Kang Hai Song, testifying later, he was afraid passenger movement would quote, cause the boat list to worsen. Many of the students were texting back and forth worriedly with their families and friends about the situation. Some teachers even stayed close with the students to ensure they stayed put as instructed, convinced it was just an orderly evacuation and they were essentially awaiting their turn. 
Outside, Coast Guard helicopter B-511 from Mokpo had arrived first and was the unit to save what few passengers had either ignored or didn't hear the stay put announcement and could be seen prominently on the starboard side. Soon after, patrol vessel 123 had arrived from Mach Po and was appointed by Coast Guard HQ as on-scene commander. The vessel was in communication with Mach Po station and the surrounding volunteer ships in what they claim was an effort to coordinate rescue plans. The bridge of the seawall, however, still tying up all lines of communication with numerous calls to Jindo station and their company offices to, quote, report the situation, meant no one on board was in contact with the now on-scene command vessel just outside. Jindo Station informed them the captain needed to decide quickly whether to start the evacuation, but the captain would refuse, stating there were too many passengers to rescue with one helicopter. The Coast Guard station on the line with him would not override the captain's decision, despite really any Coast Guard unit he was in contact with by that point having authority, even an obligation, to do so when a captain or crew are in such outright dereliction of duty. The final communication from the bridge would be one of those numerous calls with Chindo Station, in particular the second mate notifying them the list was now 60 degrees to port and all passengers had been ordered to evacuate. Communications would never take place between the bridge and patrol vessel during these critical moments, the helicopters also talking on a different frequency than both the patrol boat and the seawall were not aware of any additional passengers inside. At 9.38, patrol vessel 123 sent out one inflatable to rescue a group of engineering crew members outside on the deck and attached the vessel to the stricken ferry via mooring line. While at the seawall, a Coast Guard crewman climbed aboard to prepare lifeboats as well. Two of the life rafts dropped into the water and the crewman returned to the inflatable without checking for survivors, entering the ferry, or attempting to guide anyone to the lifeboats. At 9.46, the patrol vessel's inflatable would return promptly to rescue the captain and remaining bridge crew. Just prior to this, Korean Coast Guard HQ ordered the patrol vessel to send crewmen aboard the seawall and enter the ship to look for survivors. One crewman, Park Sang-wook, climbed aboard, found the bridge was empty, and went no further, returning after simply releasing the mooring rope connecting the two ships, as the patrol vessel would now distance itself from the capsizing ferry. No one questioning the captain's decision to abandon his post with hundreds still on board. The one guest services officer, two seawall crew members, a handful of high school teachers and other adult passengers that did take matters into their own hands would brave the flooded compartments helping as many students as they could to escape, jumping into the freezing water from what little exposed exits they could still find. Civilians in ships and fishing boats rescued many of those clinging to the decks and those who had jumped into the water. During much of this time, though, helicopters simply loitered in the air above, watching, even communicating with Korea's Blue House, the executive office and official residence of the ROK's head of state, the president of the Republic of Korea. The Blue House contacting them over and over requesting, quote, reports in a live video feed of the stricken ferry. <laughs> At 9.56, Coast Guard Cutter 3009, monitoring from 70 miles away with a high-ranking commander on board, had dispatched the one helicopter that arrived first on scene one of the three that had been loitering above since roughly 908, only rescuing a handful of survivors. This commander on Cutter 3009 would order patrol vessel 123 to use their loudspeakers and announce, abandon the ferry. The patrol vessel, however, did not follow this order. 1006, the patrol vessel approached the seawall once more and reportedly rescued another handful of passengers. It would then distance itself for the final time and at 10.13 reported that they were pulling away from the ferry due to complete capsizing. At 10.14, Korea Coast Guard HQ ordered the patrol vessel to rescue all passengers aboard the ferry. The patrol vessel refused. 10.24, HQ again orders vessel 123 to send crew aboard to climb in and enter the ferry. Again, those aboard the patrol vessel refused. 
By 1031, now completely inverted, only the small forwardmost bottom section of bow was exposed, with the remainder of the vessel submerged. The seawall remained in this state until nightfall, with 300 plus souls still unaccounted for, most of them students. Korean officials would immediately begin releasing to the media conflicting information with the overarching theme that, quote, all survivors had been rescued. Families took it upon themselves to gather on Jindo Island later that day in an impromptu facility that was a purported meeting point set up by the government for, quote, those that had been rescued. Worriedly reading from falsified lists of names made to look as if their loved ones had survived, but their loved ones weren't at the facility. Most were trapped in a vessel that, into the following night, the bow could still be seen on the surface, providing the hope that something, anything could be done to at least attempt a rescue. It, it seemed the South Korean government had all but abandoned their loved ones, and now their families, a distraught nation, the trapped passengers and high schoolers were in a literal fight for their lives. <laughs> Thank you.